recording in progress. Welcome. It's a great day to be a Rotarian. Imagine what we can do together. Imagine our club as a place that is fun and kind. Let us uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance and an invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We give thanks for this food and fellowship. May rotary friends and rotary ways help us serve others all of our days. Amen. Joni Underwood has a guest today. She what? Oh, and he'll be back to be introduced or not later. Their guest is Dennis Bosley. Uh, cup money today in September is for B Field of South Topeka uh, for common room supplies. So dig in for that. Um, October 15th, we'll be on the Kansas River, the sandbar just uh, in the river across from the cellophane plant. Our, our club will be serving lunch for. 40 to 50 volunteers cleaning up the sandbar. If you'd like to uh, be part of that team, please see me uh, or Lee after the meeting or any time between now and October 15th. Uh, October 20th is Pints for Polio and Roger uh, has a short uh, uh, announcement. Take too much time. Hey, good morning. This is our official kickoff of our Pints for Polio, October 20th, 5.30 at Constitution Hall, courtesy of Chris and our other great Rotarian members. Uh, and that day, October 20th at noon, is the polio, our polio program at Capra Foundation, another great polio partner. So plan on momentum building, and over the next two weeks, we'll have more announcements and the chance to start gifting and signing up. Roger, I thought we were four to six. We are at 5.30 at Constitution Hall the 20th. Thank you. I will update my calendar. Uh, and and uh, do you not have a meeting after this one? Yes, right here. Right here, there's a meeting if you want to be on that polio plus committee. Trunk or treat is October 29th. We're collecting more uh, treats for that and will be for the next several times. We are collecting uh, Business clothing for the interview closet at 501. And this is probably the last time I'm going to announce that. We, we have a few more that are coming. And Marie says, if you want to get in on that, get a hold of you or, okay, get a hold of Marie. Uh, fun bucks. $5 for a personal announcement, which Joni has and Dr. has, and I have. So while they're coming up, I would like to introduce you to my older brother, Richard, who is recovering from a shoulder replacement and is back with us. Uh, in two weeks, October 6th, our Rotary program will be a young man named Jeff Neal from Sports World. A year ago, we had a Sports World speaker who, who talked to you about that organization. Sports World is a national organization which provides positive motivational speakers to the youth in our schools. Most are retired from the, either the NFL or the NBA. 
their motto of the of the organization is you're not born a winner you're not born a loser you are born a chooser and they they, they use that to launch into their presentation and they'll they talk to the principals beforehand and they'll talk about any difficulties that the kids in that school are having at that time. Uh, this, our speaker this year is Jeff Neal. He's a 300 pound ex lineman who played for the Houston Oilers. He speaks all over the US, but he'll be in Topeka October four, five and six. In the past, we've had gentlemen like Lee Roussan, who is a Colorado running back with three Super Bowl rings. We had Adrian Branch, who had a national championship ring with Maryland, and he had an NBA championship ring with the LA Lakers. So the schools have signed up, and on your tables, I've placed a number of, our, of the school schedules. Uh, you're welcome to attend any of those presentations. Just show show up and you have to go through security and through the office, but just tell them why you're there and they'll let you in. Uh, if you would like to have lunch with the pro or like to help me driving him places, uh, my number is on that sheet. Please give me a call. My hope in joining Rotary was that you all would, would help me with the financial commitment we have to this program. That has not happened yet. And another thing I would encourage is in two weeks when he's here, if you have a grandson or granddaughter who's an athlete, bring him to the meeting as a guest and let him meet this guy. Questions? Thank you. Perilously close to the time penalty on that, Dr. Gimple. <laughs> that was 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, Dennis, come up here, please. Uh, you were introduced, you were supposed to be introduced as a guest. I had to explain to them that you had an urgent need, you need to be in front of me. So, anyway, this is Dennis Bosley. He is my guest for today. And I met him at an event, and we are just chit-chatting, because you know I'm shy and retiring. And he learned that uh, I'm from the Rotary Club of Topeka. And he gets all excited and starts saying, Well, I was a member of the Rotary Club in Dighton, Kansas, back in the early 80s. And this sure looks familiar. Yes, I remember. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to speak just for a couple of minutes. I'm the founder of the Crisis Intervention Team Program in the Mental Health Court, the Alternative Sentencing Court here in Topeka. And I would like to speak to your contribution to a program, a very vital program in the jail. I just want to read it, about four paragraphs from Bill Persinger from Vallejo. With the support of Rotary and other organizations and with matching funds from Vallejo, the program is off the ground and running and services are being provided. This is for women who are getting out of jail, okay? Brian Cole has been extremely helpful. Office space at the jail has been established. Services are rendered in individual meetings and in groups. ITC's focus is on building protective factors around those involved to help ensure their success upon release. Protective factors would include a focus on family and healthy friendships treatment, housing, work, and other life areas. Emphasis is on skill building. Work also focuses on release planning with protective factors in place. In context, ITC is part of a larger collaborative effort of many agencies, including Vallejo, that focuses on how behavioral health care, mental health and addictions treatment enhances public safety. ITC enjoys it network of other public <clears throat> safety related services in Shawnee County, including the Christ Intervention Team Program and so forth. This is a big shot in the arm. I, I, I personally, I didn't expect it. And this, this is amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, what he's talking about is, uh, I think it was two, three years ago, 
we awarded a grant to uh, the YWCA for uh, the women and their day center. And then that was matched with international funds with the help of uh, Larry. Yeah. And so I just wanted us to really experience that what we do, those dollars that we donate both to our local foundation and to the international make a difference. So. And I just want to say yesterday or on Monday, we had our statewide Kansas Crisis Intervention Team Association meeting. And I just really loved bragging about Rotary, what we were doing <laughs> in Topeka. It was just beyond, it was way off. The charts. But thank you. Yeah, I'm putting my twenty dollars in for self self promotion. Um, <laughs> it, I have a wonderful opportunity for anybody who has ever wanted to participate in a marathon but didn't want to run. So <laughs> <laughs> on on October 9th, I'm going to participate in the Chicago Marathon as a St. Jude hero, which means I've made a commitment to raise money for them. And um, if anybody would like to join me in that journey. I have a Facebook page out there. Some people have already made a commitment to that, David. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, but I'm out there on Facebook. And if, if you'd like to talk to me about it, I can help you other other ways. Or check. <laughs> Thank you. Or check. It would be fine. I can help you make it out if you <laughs> I'll add the zeros. OK. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Any more announcements? Okay. Uh, we've talked about clothing. I know Marie uh, spent $4,000 a couple days ago and has another three or four to spend. And we'll be getting that clothing to uh, elementary school children in 501 that need uh, clothing, need clean clothing when they get to school. Trunk or treat is October 29th from two to four. Not only are we collecting candy, but if you can put that on your calendar, two to four and uh, offer your trunk as one of the stops in the parking lot. We are really building momentum as a service club. And in that regard, the zoo's still looking for Friday uh, morning zoo light volunteers. So if you do want to do that, uh, see Fawn Moser here at the zoo, or Brendan, who's busting tables. I think that's our announcement. So I'm going to turn it over to Zach. All right, well, good afternoon. One of the things I love about Rotary is I love the presentations we have and just the variety of speakers. And so today will not disappoint. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Annalisa Swanson. She is, uh, she grew up in rural Minnesota, and that's really where her passion for agriculture began. She, particularly working with pigs. Today, she lives in Maple Hill uh, and thoroughly enjoys conversations with uh, consumers, all of us, from all backgrounds about where their food comes from. Uh, from an education standpoint, Annalisa earned her Master of Science in Swine Nutrition from South Dakota State University and also holds a Bachelor of Science in Animal Science from Kansas State University. And she volunteers out of passion her time. So her presentations as she goes around and, and speaks to um, this topic that we're looking at from a big global perspective, but also she may talk a little bit about how your Thanksgiving might be impacted this year as well. So that got my attention. So Annalisa. Can everybody hear me okay before I start talking? Does it give volume? Oh, wait. Does that Can everybody see that okay? All right. So today I'm going to be talking with you. How did the pandemic impact our global supply of pork? And also where are we at in terms of modern pork 
production these days. And I'm assuming a lot of you are curious on why is a 25-year-old female talking to me about pigs? What does she know, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm just going to start with my story. Uh, like mentioned, I come from the great state of Minnesota, so I actually come from the pig, the pig world. I grew up on a farm um, in south central Minnesota, so if anybody's familiar with Blue Earth or Fairmont, I'm, I'm from Bacon Capital. Uh, the awesome guy here in the graduation photo, that is my dad. Uh, dad got me into pigs, so we've been raising pigs since I came out of the womb. And um, we started with our sows. So dad had a sow to fair, or a fair to finish operation. So we had everything from the moms, to the babies, all the way out until, when, until they went to market. Uh, when I, so I grew up with it. Dad had me in diapers, in the feed cart, pushing to help feed sows and since I came out. So uh, he's my best friend. He inspired me to do what I do. Um, and he's a, oh, just an awesome person and a great pig farmer. So today, what does my dad do? Today, we have um, a commercial operation, so we custom feed. So we're the family where we get the baby pigs and we feed them all the way out to market. Now, when you think about where your pork comes from, would you ever think that my family would raise it, that most of your pork, would you believe that I say we raise 4,800 pigs in a year? <laughs> so that's, where, that's your pork supply. Your pork supply comes from people that are very passionate and so excited to be here. So that's my family background. Um, how did I end up in Kansas and why am I still here? So I did go to K-State. My undergraduate degree was focused in animal science, but more so specifically looking at swine or swine nutrition. So uh, I decided I missed the frozen tundra and wanted to go up back where I was from. So I did my master's degree in swine nutrition at South Dakota State. So what did I study? I was looking at how do you influence the babies by feeding the mom something different? So I was feeding a mom um, a, fat, a fatty acid, so looking at a fat source of the mom to see if I can uh, influence the gut microbiome of that piglet once it was on the ground and born and all the way up to market. So that's what my degree lies in. Um, the fun picture in the middle, so how did I get back down to Kansas after I was done with school? The fun photo in the middle, that's uh, at my fiance's family's ranch. So um, I moved down here after I was out of school, and uh, we raised show pigs. So not commercial pigs, but we raised show pigs. Um, and then the really handsome fella and the dog, that would be my fiance. After about one month before I graduated K-State, I told myself, I don't really want to marry. I just want to go. I want to go out, get my degree, and go chase the world and chase pigs. Well, <laughs> jokes on me. I met Ben, ben um, the month before I graduated and uh, fell in love with him and fell in love with Kansas. So I am back. So what do I do now? I actually work for Seaboard Foods, so which is out of Kansas City. Uh, you may not recognize that name, but if you were to go to a grocery store like Sam's Club or Walmart and see Prairie Fresh, um, that's the company I work for. So I am on the product management team where I sit and look at how can I influence where meat is going to go and how am I going to get it shipped there? And I look at how old that meat is and where, what if we have um, opportunity to get to it to get supply to a Walmart in New Jersey versus a Walmart in California. So my role is um, definitely looking at inventory of pork and where can it go. So that's what I do now. Um, I would have, I finished my degree in February and then I started at this job on Valentine's Day. So I am fairly new, but uh, I'm having fun and I love it every day. So to begin, we're going to talk about what happened with the pandemic. I'm assuming a lot of you remember when shelves were empty of meat and a lot of supplies, right? And I'm assuming a lot of you are asking, well, what in the world is going on and why aren't, why don't we have meat? So um, to answer that, it's kind of a lot of, a lot of bottlenecks that happened in our industry. So just to run through how modern pork production and this timeline of it. So that cute boy right there, he's taking an ear of corn and uh, corn is utilized as our energy source for sat or for pigs. So that's what they're going to eat primarily for their carbs. And then we see a piece of meat here in the middle. That's actually a bacon slab or a belly slab. And then we see the grocery store. So where did the disruption, the disruption in our timeline fall? That was where, this is where it was at. So when we think about what happened, it actually happened at the meat industry level. So we think about all of these pigs that we produce, like my family produces, they have to go to a packing plant. Well, when COVID happened, um, we didn't have the space requirements in our processing facilities to have that many people standing next to each other. We 
because they're online and they're working, but they couldn't have the proper distance that they needed. So we ended up killing less pigs per day, which decreased the amount of meat you were seeing on the shelf. So that also created another bottleneck feature because if you have all of these pigs that have to go to market, well, what are we going to do with them? So from a nutrition perspective, we had to figure out different ingredients and different nutritional strategies that we could use to slow down those pigs before they could get to market. So that was a fun thing to do. Um, it was a huge headache for a lot of people, but honestly, pretty incredible to see what the industry did. So a lot of solutions were to influence water intake. If you can get them to drink more, if you put their diet a little bit more salty, it'll make them want to drink more. So we can't, so they're not gaining near as much weight. Or you make it a little hot and toasty in the barn for them, and they don't really want to eat a lot. So there's just a lot of cool things that nutritionists manipulated to slow them down. So uh, today we're still facing some battles in the supply chain. Uh, there's a lot of issues in terms of transportation. You see, um, we have the pig supply there, um, but we're also now just getting hit with disease in our industry as well. So we're doing okay, but we are we don't have near as many pigs as what we did before COVID. So what is our job as pork producers? Well, our job is to raise safe and healthy pigs for the food supply. And uh, this picture actually is really, really near and dear to my heart. That's my dad and that's my niece. And uh, that's in our pig barn and dad was showing Sadie the, the ways of the land. And it's so cute when we go home, Sadie loves to come in the barns and chase the pigs around and help dad. So, um, so what are the requirements to raise safe and healthy pigs? So, how do we get this baby to market? A lot of the a lot of factors are proper diet and nutrition. You wouldn't believe me when I say they're going to go through roughly nine diets in their entire life. So they have a nutritionist. I'm a nutritionist, and I can tell you there's a full boatload of diets that they are going to see in their life. So we ensure that they have proper nutrition. We look at making sure they have fresh water. So dad's going to walk his barn every single day, if not morning and night. Some may say it's to get away from his daughters and his wife, or others will say it's because he's an awesome farmer. And then vaccinations. So just like humans, we have vaccination protocols for pigs. So when they're weaned, so when they're weaned off of mom and move into different barns, we need to think about, well, they're going to go through stresses and they're going to be exposed to different things. So we have to have proper vaccinations in place. And then barn sanitation. I will go into biosecurity and barn sanitation a little bit further down the road in this presentation. And then also talking about, well, how do we protect our animals from disease and illness? And a lot of people may think, well, why are pigs even indoors? Why does that, why do they have to be indoors? Why can't they live outside like cattle? Well, protecting them from diseases and um, making sure that we mitigate that is crucial and why that, and that's one of the reasons. And then veterinary oversight. So not only do they have a nutritionist, they also have a one-to-one -one ratio to a vet. So every pig is going to have a vet, and they're going to be oversaw by not only a farmer, but a veterinarian. And then making sure that we have proper um, observations in terms of making sure we see the pig when he's sick and picking up on the symptoms of a sick pig, just like you would if you see your kid sneeze. Uh-oh, <laughs> what could happen here? So it's pretty much the same thing in terms of spotting that and, and uh, picking it up in the early pack, in the early time. So, like I had mentioned, every pig has a nutritionist. That's what I went to school for and studied. Um, so pigs are fed just what we're fed. Uh, they're fed protein. So their protein source instead of meat is going to be soybean meal or soybean. So we feed them a corn soybean meal diet. So we look at corn as their energy source and soybean meal as their protein source. And then they get all fun sorts of fun things such as vitamins and minerals. And then in the summertime, we like to feed them a little bit more energy just because when it's hot, we don't want to eat that much, right? Well, if we want those pigs to contain or maintain a proper growth rate, we need them to eat less but have more calories in that diet. So we'll feed a fat source or we'll feed more corn or more energy to them. And then every diet is actually balanced on gender. So is it a male pig or a female pig? And what is their weight? So we're not going to feed a 40 pound pig the same as what we're going to feed a 300 pound pig. So there's a lot of fun math problems that go into being nutritionist and not many people think about that, but there is. So now that we've uh, talked about the nutritional role, so we know that a consistent high quality feed actually makes a consistent high quality pork. 
pigs are what they eat. So if we were to feed a pig straight oil, you're going to see a lot of oil in that meat product just because they're going to represent what they eat. And now transitioning into, so how do we properly cook pork? How many in here think pork can be one of the driest things I've ever tasted? You can, you can be honest. I grew up, uh, mom used to bake pork chops. And I remember, I used to hate the days when we started having pork chops for dinner because I would come home, mom would throw it in the oven, and she would just bake them to come past done. But now we've learned how to actually properly cook pork. So does anybody think you can cook pork to a medium rare? Or have you been told you cannot do that? The answer is yes, pork can be cooked to medium rare. The reasoning why we were doing it and why you were told that you can't cook it that way is because pork, pigs were once raised outside. So you run the risk of tapeworms and that type of thing, but we don't raise pigs outside, we raise them indoors. So we don't have to worry about cooking them past done. So a proper temperature to shoot for is around that 145 to 150 range. If you want to go medium, it's close to 150 to 155. Medium well is at 155 to 160. And then if you want it overdone or well, <laughs> one thing. <laughs> And so this does not apply to ground pork. So ground pork is a different beast of its own. Ground pork gets, gets mixed just like ground beef. Make sure you're cooking that to one six just to influence. That's more so on a pathogen basis versus um, what we were thinking in terms of whole product. So ground pork, make sure you still cook that to one six. Okay, so now I'm moving into why are pigs indoors? So most of our pig population is actually going to be in the frozen tundra, which is surprising, but and we mimic or pork production follows the corn belt. So in the United States, most of our corn production is going to be in the northern states. So you have Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, Nebraska, and there's some pig production down here. And then North Carolina also has a lot of pig production, but um, for the most part, we're up in the northern hemisphere. So we can have a day where it is January and it is negative 50 degrees outside and we do not want to have pigs out there. So we'd much rather have them protected against the snow. I've seen barns that will have two foot of snow on top of the roof just because that's, how, that's what happens up in the frozen tundra. And so that is one reason. And another reason is because it has, we can have consistent, constant care of nutrition and an eye to eye with those animals. If they're in pens, we can see and evaluate what status they're at. And we can evaluate them more than one day. Um, my dad at most barns have a, um, a control panel set up within the barn where let's say we set our barn at 80 degrees today and all of a sudden something happened either with a heater or a fan and our barn temperature drops to 60 degrees. Well, if that were to happen, there's a control system within barns where it's going to actually call your cell phone or send you a text or send you an email that says, hey, we have this alarm going off in the barn. Our temperature is dropping. You need to check this out. That's what we have going on. Um, so we have the constant level of that, and then we can also monitor feed and water. So making sure that they have proper feed, making sure there's not a holdup in one of the lines going into the barn. We have that ability to do that. And the identification of illness. It's so simple, we can walk through a pen, say we have 150 pigs in here. Well, if we walk and we see a pig off in the corner by itself, that's a good indication that there's something wrong. You can quickly go identify it, and then they'll use paint or paint stick to quickly identify that animal. And then they'll go back and record it in a book saying, hey, this pig in pen 20 was, had a fever or looked to have these symptoms. So we can address it based upon that. And then a huge, huge factor, I had talked about it before, um, and I'm, there's more slides up ahead about it, but it's biosecurity. So when you think about a human or a baby being born, that mom wants to protect it the best, as, the best as she can, right? We're the same way about pigs. Um, biosecurity is huge to us. So when we think about diseases and how they can travel in air, we can, I can walk out of here and we could have something on our shoes. Well, I don't want to bring that into a, a pig barn. I don't want to give that pig that sickness. So we keep them in barns to protect them from that. Uh, biosecurity is huge. So one of the factors that we do is we actually shower into barns. And I can't wear street clothes into a pig barn, so I have to actually change into clothes that are just only going to be in that pig barn. Um, so that's just a couple of things about security, and I'll 
continue on with that. So now to talk about the barn specialization. So we have multiple barns actually that we use for pig production. So a sow farm, and does anybody know what a sow farm is or have an idea of what a sow farm is? A, yeah, a sow farm. Do you know what a sow farm is? So a sow farm is going to be where we actually only have the moms and her baby. Yeah, so we are going to have, it's, we can have up to 2,000 sows in a barn or 10,000 sows in a barn. So this is where we're going to keep our moms together. And the reason why we do this is because if we space them out across an area, we run the risk of, well, if something happens in this barn, if there's a disease outbreak here, it can travel in the air and come to this barn. So if we protect and have a large quantity in one space, we mitigate that disease. So there's a couple of different barns within that sow farm. So mom, the sows, are, they like their environment very cool. So they like their barn around 60 degrees. Well, the babies, on the other hand, they're not born with a lot of fat on their bodies, right? So they need, they need a different, they need a, a, an external heat source. So we keep them in a farrowing or a birthing space. Um, so here, this, this guy in the, the purple, he's in the breeding and gestation barn. So this is where we're going to breed these sows or these animals, and then we're going to keep them there for gestation. Gestation is just a fancy word for pregnancy. And so sows are actually going to be pregnant for three months, three weeks, and three days. Very specific. I have no idea why, um, but that is, that's one cool thing about sows. So they'll spend the, their pregnancy in this controlled environment in the breeding barn or gestation barn. And then within the same barn, but down a different hallway, they're gonna go into the birthing center or the farrowing center. And this is where we can have specialized uh, outlooks on their, piglet, on their piglets and on the farrowing process or the birthing process. So mom will come in here about three days before she's due and she's gonna, she has luxury, she has lay of the land. She gets all of the feed she can eat and she has this a large amount of space where she can sit and lay down and really be by herself. Um, you may be wondering, well, why don't you keep them, keep them in tents? Why can't they be by each other? Well, if I were pregnant and if I were having a kid, I wouldn't want to be next to somebody either. So they're kept separate. And it's because, one, sows are very large. Um, most sows will run between 400 to 700 pounds. Well, we don't need to have that many that much weight in comparison to how little their babies are. We like to mitigate that. And just because they're protective, they don't want anybody next to their babies. So we like to keep them, give them space and give them proper um, control there. Uh, I don't believe with stalls, so they're in stalls and I don't, I don't have a picture of it, but in the summertime, how we control the cooling factor, because like I mentioned, babies need to be warm. So how we control the sow to have a nice cool temperature is we actually have drippers that hang from the ceiling and are only up by the sow's head. So if that room, that room that she's in with holding that baby, um, if that gets to a certain temperature, it's going to flag these drippers to start dripping on the sow's neck. So I'm telling you, she's living in seventh heaven, having a grand old time. Um, so we have that. And then when, when she starts to give birth, uh, a sow is going to have roughly 12 to 14 piglets on average. So that's a crazy amount, right? But we need to make sure that those babies come out alive and that come out healthy. So how we do that is we actually have people who monitor these sows, just like doctors monitor people. So a sow, when she starts her birthing process or her farrowing process, she's going to have a pig every 20 minutes. Yeah, I call sows boss ladies for that exact reason, because they are some very, they're awesome creatures. So um, if mom is having problems and she, we've noticed that we brought on the card, she had a pig at 920 this morning. Well, if we come back and look and it's 950, we need to help. We need to help her out. So we have different protocols set to actually sleeve and pull out babies and help her that way. Um, I like to call myself a sow midwife. I spent summers doing nothing but sow research projects to make sure that her farrowing duration is in the proper, in the proper window. So I go through and look at, well, how can you feed them differently? Anyway, spend a lot of time, help Sarah, well, thousands of sows, call myself a sow midwife. Um, so once babies hit around 21 days of age, they're actually gonna be weaned off of mom and go into a completely new barn. So 
So they're going to leave that sow facility and go to either someone like my dad or another farmer down the road. And they are going to either go into a nursery or a wean to finish farm. And nurseries um, are kind of older type of mindset in terms of, well, what are they used for? So nurseries are only going to have those babies for about six weeks, and then they're going to go to a finishing farm. Well, our industry has been like, well, that's silly because when you move them once, they're stressed out, and then you move them again, so they're stressed again. So why don't we just build a barn that has the, the capacity to hold them when they're little and also that six weeks of age? So now we have wean to finish barn. So they don't have to be in a nursery. So um, they'll spend roughly six months after their weaned growing, and then they go off to market. So we call those barns the wean to finish barns or nursery grow finish barns. So now to talk about cleanliness. Um, we power wash our barns after pigs are moved out of a barn. We're going to sit and spend hours and hours and hours power washing this barn with hot water and then sanitize it. Um, I will tell you right now, we have a, so we have a 2,400 head wean to finish barn. And when those pigs are weaned, it takes us roughly 40 hours to power wash that barn. So you spend a lot of time making sure every nook and cranny is power washed, cleaned out before any new babies come into that barn. And that's just because if there was any diseases or pathogens or E. coli or whatever that was in there from the pigs before, we don't want to give it to the next pig. So we ensure that we have a nice sanitized barn and it's warm and safe and ready for those babies to come in. And the same goes for sow farms too. We power wash every group. So once, a sow, once the sows come into the birthing center and when they're ready to be weaned, they'll go back into the breeding barn and we're going to sanitize that barn before we bring in new New mama. So uh, I'm sure you picked up farming is definitely a family affair and it's designed to last for generations. Um, and we've worked on sustainability efforts and everyday practices. And so we're always continuing to advance and what can we do next? How can we improve this? Does this work? And we're also working on being able to come and speak to consumers, you know, give you the message of what is the pork industry? What does that even mean? Are you in a capo or are you in a factory farm or what what's your story so that's what we're working on advancing so i have some fun some fun fun facts about the pork industry and global warming and our total emissions so the pork industry contributes to approximately one third of one percent of our total u.s emissions uh, so how do we accomplish that? Well, we are purposeful with our use of natural resources, and we use less than our parents and our grandparents ever have. So our land usage has decreased by 75.9%. And some of that could be contributed to, well, we've discovered that we don't need to have a nursery barn when you can just have the technology and the engineering to have that barn combined into a finishing barn. We've decreased our water usage. We have a purpose for why we would use water. And we develop pigs to be efficient with water usage. Our carbon footprint is down 7.7% and our energy usage is down 7%. So um, just to show you that bottom, that bottom photo of that tractor with the honey wagon behind it, it's actually applying pig manure to that field. So we're continuously reusing what we have to supply not only safe and healthy pork, but corn and soybeans and those types of things. And you may be wondering, well, how is that regulated? Uh, animal manure or animal wastage is more tightly regulated in terms of the USDA and the government than chemical fertilizers are. So we've got it figured out, we have it down to a science. Before this can even go to the field, it has to go through a laboratory and get evaluated for all of the nitrates and those types of things. Mm -hmm. So another fun fact for you, uh, U.S. citizens would have to quit using the refrigerators and take 90 fewer showers in a year to make a similar environmental impact. So I don't know who wants to quit taking showers for 90 days, but. So, and how are these made? Like I had said, we have enhanced pig genetics. We've enhanced our barn technology. Um, when we have sows that are in pens, or pigs that are pigs in pens, but more specifically sows, we have developed a feeding system where they have EIT tags in their ears and they're allowed to go into these feeders with these EIDs. Well, you may be wondering, well, they're pigs. How do they, how do they even know how to do that? Um, pigs are one of the smartest creatures. They, uh, 
if they know, they'll figure out when their time of feed is. So let's say they get fed at 11 p.m. at night. Just throwing that out there. They will develop a social hierarchy within their pen, and they will line up single files to go into the feed system. It, you wouldn't believe me, but I've seen it from my own eyes. It's wild. So we have those genetics. We have the new technology in barns. We've improved how we feed pigs in, in our watering system. You know, we have people like me who nerd out about pig nutrition and pig genetics that just spend every day talking about pigs and love it. Um, and then we've improved our health protocols. So we have a lot of new, new um, regulations in, installed for us. So when, when you go to a store and you say antibiotic free, how many of you think, oh my gosh, this is the only product that's antibiotic free? This is crazy, right? Well, that's a marketing scheme. So please do not, don't spend extra money on antibiotic free labeled pork or meat because we can't bring an animal to the market with antibiotics in it. That's not allowed. That's, that's illegal. We will get huge fines. So we've improved our, our protocols. We've, um, we are now regulated in terms of you can't put in, in the antibiotic, whether that be just a, a pain killer like Adibol, or Advil. We can't even put that in the feed or in the water without the vet saying, yes, this is, this is good. Go ahead. I'm going to sign off on that. So we have those protocols in place. So now to talk about pork cuts. And uh, so where, your, where does your meat come from? And we'll start off on the shoulder. So your shoulder is going to have pulled pork. So here we're going to have the Boston butt or the picnic, which is below. And you're going to get pulled pork, op sorry, excuse me, pulled pork options. So if you like barbecue, that's where most of your barbecue meat is going to come from. And then if we move up top to the loin, that is where pork chops come from. Those who love a stuffed pork tenderloin, that's where it comes from. Um, and then moving down below, our fan favorite, bacon. Bacon comes from the side or the belly. And then near the end is the leg where we can get different things of ham and uh, ham steaks, those types of things. So that's our pork cut. And then any part of the meat. So if we trim up those products before we put them in a, a vacuum sealed um, container to get shipped out to consumers, anything that we trim off, we put into ground pork. So if we have a spec saying this belly has to be a nine by 10. Well, if it was a nine by 11, that one inch goes to trim, goes to crown pork. So now to have tips for buying pork. Um, pork should always be a pink reddish color. Those are marketing where we said pork, the other white meat was the worst marketing plan we ever could have done because that's not true. Pork should be red. It should be pink. And when you look at pork, look for the marbling, the whiteness of that, because that's your flavor. Fat is flavor, and it's the same for steaks just as it is for pork chops or tender ones. So look for that pork that has marbling or the small white flakes of fat. And then uh, you want to avoid meat that has a super dark colored bone or the one that looks where we have fat that looks a little yellowish in color or darker. So those are just some tips and tricks for buying pork. And if you want to learn more, there's plenty of people out there that have a very similar story to me or an even better one that you can learn about and you can learn how different porking, pork um, ways to cook pork, different recipes, what to use it with, what to tie it with. And you can find that at www.pork.org or go follow us and follow us and look at our pork story. So with that, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Are your shrimp pigs not trained? No, not yet. <laughs> oh yeah um so i grew up showing pigs and i used to uh make my before i could walk them i would make they would come out of the pen and i made sure that they had to sit before we went on our walk <laughs> oh yeah i do i also have a survey code if you could you can if you pull up your phone and take a snapshot or do it it will pull up the survey i have that um oh so then my Turkey, fun fact for you. This year we're seeing insane decreases in turkey availability just because there's not many turkeys available. So when you think about Thanksgiving, you're not going to have many turkeys. So if you want an awesome stellar alternative, ham is the way to go. <laughs> Answer questions yes. after we're done. Yes. Thank you.
Well, that's great. Now, I, when someone says you eat like a pig, I'll say, yes, I'm third in line. <laughs> uh, we will be donating a, a book to the Ross Elementary School uh, in, in uh, honor of our speaker today. Next week, there is no noon program. No noon program next week. We will be having a social at the Capra Foundation uh, in their courtyard from four to six. If you saw my uh, weekly email, there's uh, directions, but just go to the front door, which is in the back of the building, uh, and they'll get you there. If you have any questions about it, you can call Zach at 785-506-7114. If you brought candy or clothes, be sure you put your name on the sign-in sheet so that we can mark you down as participating in that service project. Please sign out as you leave if you didn't sign in as you came. And let's stand with the four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you all. Get in line for lunch.